vaccine. I'm Dr. Naima Bulbul, Associate Professor and Chair, Department of Biochemistry and Microbiology, Nasset University. I'm pleased to welcome all of you to our department, which is housed in the School of Health and Life Sciences at the Nasset University. Um, today, as our session ch uh, chair, we have Professor Dr. Hassan Mahmoud Reza, uh, though he's not here right now amongst us, but he will join. Um, Professor Reza is our acting dean of the School of Health and Life Sciences. Uh, and I would like to thank our eminent speakers today, Dr. Kaji Nadim Hassan, professor of our department, Dr. Mustafizur Rahman, senior scientist and head of virology lab of ICDDRB, and Dr. Mohammed Maksud Hussain, director, Genome Research Institute of North City, as well as associate professor, Department of Biochemistry and Microbiology. So I'd like to thank all of our eminent speakers to our department because they have made their time out of their busy schedule to be with us and enlighten our students with their valuable findings. Before we move into the today's program, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to speak a few words about the, our department. Currently, the department offers two programs, undergraduate programs, BSc in Honors in Bi uh, Microbiology and BSc Honors in Biochemistry and Biotechnology, and one graduate program that is MSc in Bi uh, Biotechnology. We have almost all the amenities to support uh, the faculties to conduct world-class research, as well as provide a homogeneous environment, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, for one-on-one -on -one interaction amongst uh, faculty, staff, and students all, at all the levels. Our department started its journey back in summer 2006. That was with MS in Biotech program, only with 11 students. Later on, in spring 2007, our uh, undergrad programs, two, uh, two undergraduate programs, MS in, uh, sorry, BSc in Microbiology and BSc in Biochemistry and Biotechnology started. And that started only with 10 students in both the programs. However, from then and up to today, till that, uh, we have Currently, we have in summer 2020 semester, we have 1,206 students enrolled in all three programs. Our department focuses in developing young individuals who will contribute to the academia, industry, government and non-government organizations locally and globally in the coming days. Our mission is to provide programs composed of courses which will equip our students with a solid foundation in the biological sciences, alongside training them at the forefront of research. The vision of this department is to reach national and international recognition for excellence, innovation, and regional engagement. Our department uses American curriculum-based teaching approach, which incorporates a wide range of elective courses in addition to the core subjects that promote the development of students in all aspects. Since the inception of the department, we are maintaining a long tradition of excellence in teaching and research. It has only been possible because of the faculty, students, and staff who are dedicated to, the, uh, to promote our uh, department as well as our university, and it, uh, we promote the cutting edge research, outstanding teaching and service to the community. The Department of Biochemistry and Microbiology at the North South University provides substantial inventory of modern microbiological, biotechnological, and biochemical instrumentation to support teaching and research. Students will have the opportunities to utilize all the laboratories and equipments in their regular laboratory courses, as well as with their project work or, or thesis works. So that makes us unique amongst all the private and public universities of Bangladesh. In addition, the establishment, in addition, uh, in addition since the establishment of the NSU Genome Research Institute back in 2017, 
uh, it has expanded the dimension of research in microbial genetics, pathogenesis, <laughs> genomics, molecular biology, immunology at, uh, at the department. Our research efforts are supported by the university and external funds and allow our students to make novel and intriguing uh, observations that they can present in national and international conferences, meetings, and publish in renowned journals. Students of our department also have the opportunity to join the Bioscience Club, which promotes our students' interest in life sciences and connect them with the academic and professional world. We have a dynamic group of students uh, who are leading the uh, this license club and are engaged in many extracurricular activity, which also uh, grooms our students in a very unique way. So there are several areas of research that are carried out in our department like infectious diseases and molecular biology, the diagnostic approaches or different diagnostic approaches are being um, experimented here. Also the experiments on bio different uh, areas of antibiotic resistance of microbes, food ad adulteration, bioremediation, environmental microbiology, bioinformatics, all are carried out by our uh, distinguished and esteemed colleagues. As scientific investigators, faculties here are not only engaged in teaching, but also in training the next generation of talented young scientists who will meet the challenges of the 21st century. Our research spans broader area of microbiology, biochemistry, and biotechnology. And under the current global crisis due to COVID-19 pandemic, these subjects, all these subjects, microbiology, biotechnology, and biochemistry, are the sciences that have emerged as the vital source of information to combat this notorious agent. To fight against this uh, pathogens, trained personnel from the areas of microbiology, biotechnology, biochemistry are needed more these days. Therefore, our department has taken the effort to organize this webinar which I believe will enlighten our students and will and the audiences with different aspects of combating the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like to share the today's event with you. Okay. So uh, today, so our, the title of our webinar is Combating COVID-19 Diagnosis, Genomics, and Vaccine. So uh, the beginning, uh, the, our first speaker is, uh, this first speech will be by Dr. Kaji Nadim Hassan followed by Dr. Maksud Hussain. So Dr. Kaji Nadim Hussain will uh, give his talk about the diagnosis of COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Maksud Hussain will reveal the, uh, will talk about the gen uh, genomics of this virus. And finally, uh, we'll uh, uh, have a speech, uh, talk from Dr. Mustafizur Rahman, who will give a talk on the vaccine, that uh, the progress on the, making a vaccine of COVID-19. So without making any further delay, I'd, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, start our event. Now, uh, before we start, let me explain how you can talk to us during the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please write your uh, question into the chat section. So we will be, answering the questions and thereby you can be connected to us. Uh, the questions will be addressed later on the, in the question and session, which is a separate session after the, all the presentations. And finally, our session chair, Professor Dr. Hassan Mahmoud Reza will end the session. So that's, uh, th that will be our program today. So first I would like to uh, move to our talk with uh, our, uh, I'd like to introduce you with the with our first speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Kaji Nadim Hassan. 
Uh, Dr. Hassan did his PhD in molecular genetics from School of Medicine, Hirosaki University, Japan. Uh, Nadim sir is a, a full-time full faculty of our department. He's a professor and he has um, ex a long term experience in different areas of biochemistry and um, this particularly in uh, immunology. And uh, Dr. Uh, Nadim Hassan joined the Nostad University in uh, since June 2009 and he also had served as our chair uh, from January 2013 to May 2014. Uh, Dr. Nadine is involved in teaching biology, proteins and enzymes, basic immunology, immunogenetics and clinical immunology, genes and diseases courses, and are responsible for taking molecular diagnostic laboratory courses. So uh, also he is conducting research in different areas of molecular diagnostics, infectious disease immunology and epidemiology clinical genetics, viral genomics. Dr. Nadim has published many articles in uh, internationally reputed peer-reviewed journals related to his research area. He is also involved in SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing project, variation of the host response against SARS-CoV-2 and in silico proteomics approach project of the, at the department at NSU. So uh, I would like to um, uh, I would like to request uh, Professor Nadim Hassan to uh, give his talk. Over to you, Dr. Nadim Hassan. Thank you, Chair of the Department of Biochemistry and Microbiology for a nice introduction. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everybody. Now, first of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the Department of Biochemistry and Microbiology for arranging this timely discussion meeting. Now, should I share my slide now? Yes, sir. Do you see the slide? Not yet, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, we can, sir. Sir, we can, you can give it to us. Okay. Yes, sir. Distinguished audience. And we all know that the pandemic of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19 continues to affect globally. And the knowledge of the diagnostic test for severe active respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, is still evolving. And a clear understanding of the nature of the test and their interpretations is very important to know. That's why so I would like to initiate our today's discussion meeting by talking on the diagnosis of SARS coronavirus 2 that in fact will include a very brief on the background, details of laboratory diagnostic procedures available, and a future directive. Okay. So as you all know that the COVID-19 outbreak was first identified at Wuhan, China in the late December 2019. At that time, the virus was named differently as Wuhan coronavirus, WHO called it, 2019 novel coronavirus, and later the virus was given an official name by the International Committee of Taxonomy and Viruses, ICTV, as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. And then WHO also declared the official name of the disease as Coronavirus Disease 2019. Okay. Let's then, we also know that. For the diagnosis of active infection by any highly contagious agent, the most effective, the most desirable approach is always early and accurate identification of the pathogen. By targeting these two, able to diagnosis for sars cov is approach, in fact, at three levels, pre-analytical, which is in fact including sample collection, transportation and processing, analytical part of diagnosis in includes the selection of diagnostic methods as the most validated, most available, less done on time, as well as cost effective. And lastly, a post analytical approach in terms of result interpretation, 
as well as laboratory clinician communication. Now let's see the first about the theoretical part of diagnosis of SARS CoV-2, which includes uh, what is the most available source of specimen where it will be available. SARS CoV-2, it was found by many studies that mostly available in the lower respiratory specimen, sputum, bronchial alveolar lavas. However, since we know that SARS CoV-2 in fact it's mostly of respiratory cell line and it does not produce any a sputum or cough, mostly uh, you know, dry cough is generated. That's why, and it was found that less than second most significant available sources of the virus is nasopharyngeal swab or pharyngeal swab, which has been selected as the best sample source for this virus. And it was also found that some form of virus are also found in the rectal swab, stool, urine, and some portion in blood, serum, plasma. Next, the parenthetical part that how the sample is collected that is very important to consider and which thing was used to collect the samples the nylon flex sword should be used and it should be inserted to go to the side of nasopharyngeal sword properly and by turning around clockwise or anti-clockwise seven to ten times you should collect the samples to get accurate amount of samples for diagnosis Next, about periodical diagnostic approach in terms of safety that the patient or the person who will be involving in collecting samples should, should have personal protective immune, uh, equipment at level three. The person who will give the samples to the laboratory, the samples should be inactivated. The person who give the sample laboratory should, should avoid the formation of aerosol should add lysis buffer to inactivate the samples. You see the centrifugal machines with the cover to prevent aerosol. So this should be followed according to the, you know, if, if you want to follow the quality measures in the pre-analytical part. Let's talk about analytical part of laboratory diagnosis of sars cov two. So which method will be selected for the diagnosis? Several or many methods are available for the identification of SARS CoV-2, like electron microscopy. Electron microscopy, in fact, analyze the morphology. It is the confirmatory. However, it detects only pathogens only at the family level. And this technology is usually used for identifying new and emerging viruses, although it is the quick test on over time. However, the equipment maintenance as well as equipment itself is very much expensive. And highly skilled persons are required to give the interpretation, although it has got low sensitivity, at least into the six virus particles are required. Next, isolation and identification of sars cov by culture, in fact, is the gold standard technique. However, for the identification as the variant, as a genus label, and it is done in the tube and shell valve culture method, sanctification required. So the technology is labor intensive, and this technology also works on culturable viruses only. In addition to those, it is mostly used for discovering research purposes and BSL-3 and above laboratory setup is required for initiating diagnosis by culture, but it is not used for the diagnosis, you know. Next, since you know, the molecular diagnosis, diagnosis, using molecular biology techniques has been using for the last two decades as conventional PCR was started to diagnose infectious agents most accurately, rapid and uh, using sensitivity, in, uh, high sensitivity and specificity. Real-time PCR technology has been evolved for the diagnosis of highly infectious diseases they had been using for the last one decade. As it is very rapid accurate compared to conventional PCR techniques. And it has very high sensitivity and specificity compared to conventional PCR techniques. You see that at least uh, 
thousand copies per ml detection limit for SARS coronavirus. Real time PCR technology requires no post PCR processing steps, therefore, it has got less chance of cross contamination. And detection technology is fluorescence based, it is also high throughput. In the real, you know, real uh, PCR technology is the DNA RNA amplification technologies. The other way, real time PCR technology is the combination of amplification and detection simultaneously. And the detection is based on light emission by the fluorescence molecules which is used gave is much more sensitive and probe and primers again at least two target genes and one pair of probes one pair of primers both are used for binding to the specific site on the viral genome therefore it is much more specific much more accurate because amplification is detected at the exponential phase of the amplification curve which give the accuracy of these techniques i will talk, to you, talk about it later there are several other molecular techniques available also you see isothermal amplification techniques which is also but less time on time same specific sensitivity a detection is fluorescence rate high throughput other molecular body techniques next generation sequencing or other sequencing methods those are used for viral genome characterization which will be discussed by dr max later so that real time PC technology use the detection chemistry, fluorescence, resonance, emission transmission, emission transmission. That's why it's much more sensitive. And since SARS coronavirus 2 is an RNA virus, so reverse transcription is required first, and then complementary DNA will be amplified and simultaneously detected. That's why this technology is in fact is called reverse transcriptase. PCR and real time reverse transcription PCR or RRT PCRs. As viral genome sequence was done from the very beginning, it was available so that for the diagnosis of SARS coronavirus 2. I will see that the SARS CoV 2 genome comprised of 30,000 base pairs, I mean, two thirds comprises what if 1A, 1B, that in fact encodes most of the non-structural proteins that also include RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and a one-third encodes a structural protein surface envelope transmembrane nucleic capsid. And since it was available from the very beginning, primers and probes were designed or developed at least again two areas of this genome, one that include the RDRP and one that include either either nuclear capsid or envelope gene sequence. With this real-time RT-PCR technology is used for the diagnosis of SARS of two infections, which in fact comprise of two significant steps, sample processing and extraction of RNA, master mix and reaction mix preparation, and then perform the one step reverse transcription and PCR amplification on real time equipment, which in fact requires to maintain a proper laboratory workflow where RNA extraction, RNA processing should be done in separated space. And then master mix, that means reagents for amplification, should be prepared in another space. And then in another space, uh, reagents and template RNA or cDNA or RNA will be mixed in separate space and it will go to another space for the amplification and detections. And you see that workflow is one way direction. All must be physically separated. Each area must involve dedicated personals, dedicated equipments, dedicated accessories. And this workflow should be maintained. Using this, you see that result interface of the diagnosis of SARS coronavirus 2 using real time RT PCR. The interface is a, it is a graphical interface, it's the table interface. I will show then later the interpretation at the time of interpretation. Okay, there are several other technologies available. We have heard about rapid antigen detection. Rapid antigen detection, in fact, is immunochromatographic assay that usually target 
nucleic acid protein that can give result in very short turn of time, 10 minutes. However, sensitivity and specificity of these states not yet expectedly, uh, not yet obtained, expect, uh, uh, you know, the, that amount of expectation, which is 90% and 90% specificity and 90% sensitivity should be achieved. However, studies are going on to achieve the sensitivity for the detection of antigen-based diagnosis. However, that should also be done in the respiratory fluids. Next, the serological techniques. You know, the serological techniques are of two kinds. You know, that as a rapid, simple point of care, again, immunochromatography-based techniques. However, it will detect the antibodies against sars cov virus 2 IgM, IgG class of antibodies will be detected. The turn on time will be 15 minutes. However, in this case also, the expected sensitivity and specificity will be more than 90% against real-time RT-PCRs. And the serology-based techniques can work on serum or plasma. If you look at this, the, you know, kinetics of the appearance of different parameters of SARS-CoV-2 in host, if you look at the graph very carefully, we see that the RNA of sars cov virus 2 will be available immediately after the symptoms in the nasopharyngeal sore. So that can make it the very early detections. On the other hand, if you look at the antibody response, at least 10 to 14 days required to develop IgM class of antibody and then the IgG class of antibodies. I will interpret it later. So now in case of post-analytical part of diagnosis, in case of real-time RTPC technologies, the quality control should be measured after analysis. That, that run should include a negative control to check the contamination. Run should include a positive control to check the amplification efficiency. And there should be internal control to check the both extraction and amplification efficiency. In terms of okay, interpretation, okay, so what we have learned from real-time RT-PCRs technology for the diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 is we should avoid devices if there is no internal ampli or amplification control is present. We should avoid devices that will target a single gene. We should prefer devices with two or three specific target genes. We should prefer the beta coronavirus specific conserved sequences for designing primary and probe. And we should have better communications with the clinicians to know then that why false negative results can occur. In case of interpersonal lessons of our real-time PCR technologies, we should, after detection, we should carefully observe the amplification curve the weather the, about this quality of detection, you see that this is the exponential phase. As soon as the RNA or cDNA is amplified, it is detected at this exponential phase that gives the accuracy of the real sample PCR technology. And the graph should be sigmoid, very sharp. And then this for each each curve is representing is for one samples, and it will appear in the table as it is. I mentioned the lower part of this. And if you observe, and then this interpretation is also very important as a quality control. If you observe signal in the RF1 gene, if you observe signal in the nucleic capsid genes, if you observe internal control gene, if you do not observe negative control, if you observe positive control, that sample should be regarded as positive. If you don't find any signal on the gene target, however, in the internal control, negative control is not having any signals, it should be interpreted as negative. Okay, now this is the point that if you see that what if one be positive, but N gene is negative, but intercontinent is positive, the sample is positive. But in case of this, if you see that signal is not detected at what if one B genes, however, N gene has got signal, internal control might have or might not, positive control has, but no negative control, but this sample should be retested. And if it is seen that it is again giving the same results, it should be interpreted as negative because it is said that by WH1 CDC both 
that N genes are used for screening purpose and ORF1B gene is used for confirmatory purpose. Okay, then all about result interpretation, what you have learned from nucleic acid versus antibodies, what should be interpreted? This is very also important that nucleic acid amplification assays, especially real-time RT-PCR techniques, is the gold standard techniques, is the test of choice till now by WHO and CDC for diagnosing acute infection by SARS-CoV-2 infection. Okay, fine. And we have seen that for very early stages, that upper respiratory tract sampling should be done. We have also experienced that pre analytical factors, what I have discussed, can result in the false negative results. False positive results can come due to carryover contamination from amplicone or because of a stressed out reference lab settings. On the other hand, serological diagnosis. What is the interpretation? In fact, detection of antibody is the indirect measure of infection. It is the host response against the virus, where IgM classes of antibody always will be interpreted as the recent infection, and IgG classes of antibody presence will represent the previous exposure or protection. However, in both cases, they will appear in the serum at least seven to 10 days after the infection occurs. Therefore, the hypothesis is serological tests can be done for the detecting the convalescence, for detecting the previous exposure, as well as for detecting the protection against sars cov 2 But for protection, you have to quantify the level of IgG if you want, uh, uh, want to understand that whether you are protective or not. So the lastly, I would conclude by saying these for ideal, you know, what should be the ideal profile as a of freezer directions. Use of fully automated real-time, fully automated real-time PC devices with high throughput options, having less turnover time with the minimum biosafety measures, laboratory setup, a testing option should be available in all decentralized locations. And overall, there must be an efficient laboratory management system networks. This ideal profile should be established as the molecular point of care testing if we really want to follow test, trace, and treat as of the most effective preventive strategy when any highly contagious disease will become pandemic or epidemic. Thank you everybody for your patient hearings. That's all from now, from me. Over to you, Dr. Naima. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nadim Hassan, Dr. Kazi Nadim Hassan. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Um, I'd like to inform you all that our uh, acting dean, School of Health and Life Sciences, Professor Dr. Hassan Mahmoud Reza, has just joined us. So the, I'd like to welcome Sir on behalf of uh, the Department of Biochemistry and Microbiology to this um, today's webinar. So thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Thank you so much, Naima. I'm really sorry for being late, but I just heard that uh, Professor Nadim was talking. I was listening and uh, please continue. Thank you. So thank you so uh, much. I'll be so, with you. It's a pleasure, sir. Thank you. So thank you, uh, everyone. Now our next speaker, um, um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mohammed Maksud Hussain, um, Director, NSU Genome Research Institute, and as a professor, full-time faculty of our department. Um, 
Dr. Maksud did his PhD in bioinformatics. This is a, his area of specialization. And he did his PhD from the University of Nottingham and his postdoctorate from the Genome Research in Genome Institute of Singapore. His team at NGRA has successfully completed genome sequencing of several SARS-CoV-2 genomes, and all data have been released in the genome database and is available for public anal analysis. Dr. Hussain has specialty in the area of bioinformatics, genomics, and molecular microbiology. He also has worked in the ICDDRB, the Modern Re uh, Research Institute Edinburgh, and took training at European Bioinformatics Institute, Cambridge, University College London, and Birmingham University. Recently, in collaborating with the University of Nottingham, University of Maryland, ICDRB, and BCSIR, the consortium has received a grant of 250 uh, G, uh, GBP for a project. So, uh, not make much delay. Over to you, Dr. Maksud Hussain. We are waiting to have your uh, listen to your talk about SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing as a gateway to the epidemic in Bangladesh. Thank you, Dr. Naima, for introducing me and for giving me the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes. And for giving me you. the opportunity to make presentation in today's webinar. So, as said by Dr. Where is that? Dr. Naima, the, the, the it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. We can see it. Yep. Okay. The title of the presentation is SARS-CoV-2 Genome Sequencing as a Gateway to the Epidemic in Bangladesh. Yeah. So as all of you know, the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 genome is a positive strand non-segmented RNA virus with 30,000 nucleotide in size. Uh, this is spherical, in, spherical and enclosed with the lipid envelope. And if you look at the green blobs here, this is the spike proteins. This is a, uh, special interest on that because it makes a, it's responsible for fusion of the viral membrane to the host cellular membrane. So I'll come in a bit about the spike protein. So what's the goals of, of the whole genome sequence analysis? First of all, we want to assess the origin of epidemic in Bangladesh using the molecular data. And then we want to uh, find the correlation between the patient outcome and the uh, there is the correlation between the patient outcome and, and its uh, viral genotype, and also want to assess the possible viral polymorphism and different body sites and the longitudinal evolution within the patients. So for the second and third goals, we'll be using the global data because we have very scarce uh, data, uh, patient data available, patient metadata available in the uh, global databases. So SARS-CoV sequencing at Northside Genome Research Institute. So uh, the project is funded by the Northside University. We did initially sequence the 20 genomes, and most of them are available in the GISAID, as mentioned by uh, earlier. And we plan to sequence 200 genomes. So we are collecting samples, respiratory samples from the patients from the different national COVID testing centers to see the heterogeneity of the isolates cir circulating in the country. Uh, sequencing is done at NASA Genome Research Institute using an um, aluminum I6 platform. And uh, after the initial, okay, after the uh, initial sequencing project, we found that the not, we are not getting uh, uh, the 100% genome coverage from all the samples. So we are trying to optimize. We are so we'll be running very soon again a uh, second round. But in the meantime, we are trying to optimize the protocols and. We think the RNA load and the CLA, CD inequality are two of the major factors. So that need to be considered. So if you can see in the right hand side here, so, so we can see that they use in our initial sequencing from our initial sequencing results, we found that the, uh, it's 99%, 90, 99.94% genome was available, search of two genomes available, which had the more than 5x coverage. So, we, so with the initial data, we some, found some uh, very good genome sequence data from our experiments. And bioinformatics analysis are all are done at NASA Genome Research Institute as well. So interestingly, in our genomes, we found the 694 nucleotides at the position at the start point compared to the 100 first genomes. 
So that needs to be looking at that. That could be the reason that most in most of the analysts, analysts they do map against the reference genome, but we uh, we assemble the genomes without uh, comparing to the reference, and that could be one of the reasons. So that would be quite interesting to look at that. And as I said, that we along with the NSU genomes, and we look at the other genomes available in the Bangladesh, and we can say that the most of the genomes. The genomes are introduced from the different countries of the world. I'll show you a video here. So that will show you the, how the, so that will show you the transmission of, uh, where is that? Sorry about that. Just give me a second there. Transmission. Share screen. Where is the transmission? Yeah. Here you go. So transmission of viruses, uh, accumulation of mutation and the transmission of virus on the... On the left-hand side, it will show you the accumulation of mutations. And on the right-hand side, it will show you the uh, transmission from the different countries, how the mutations are related to the transmission of viruses. What's happened to this one? So if you go back, so if you see here, like the the, uh, the points, the, the points here. So the mutation while accumulating after the 20th uh, after the July, actually, these isolates are these mutations are specific to the Bangladeshi isolates. So you can see there is no transmission from the other countries. So this is a, so we need to look at the these mutations as how they're related and how they're uh, affecting the viral fitness in Bangladesh. Go here. So here you go. So the average evolutionary rate is uh, approximately, I'm not going into the details. Sorry. So the mutation rate of SARS CoV 2 Bangladesh is 24.6 substitution per year. So the mutation is happening 24.6 per year. And we found the four common genomic variants in, 100 per, in mo almost all the isolates here. And two non synonymous amino acid substitutions are found in uh, ribosome represent polymerase and the spike protein. I'll come to that. So, why this is the DE614Z2G? All of you know that one. And 93% of the of our isolates belong to the GR clade. Okay. So this is quite interesting to see that the, the mutation rate around the world is six to 10, six times 10 to the minus four, while in Bangladesh it's very less compared to the Wuhan virus, 3.5 to 10 to the minus four. And we can see that 12.6 mutations events per sample in Bangladeshi samples, whereas the common mutation per sample world is 7.23. So the mutation rate is very high in Bangladeshi isolates. And as we go along with the time, we find that the divergence is in the increasing. For example, the recent isolates from the North South Genome Research Institute, we found divergence up to the, the 16, meter, uh, 16 nucleotide. For example, you can see here the data from the GIS ID. So the divergence is 15.849, and we found some unique mutations here. So, so then comes a uh, D. All of you are very familiar with the term, the D614Z mutation in the viral spike protein. So the virus which has this mutation are known as the super spreader viruses. And this uh, D614, uh, this position is located between the S1 and S2 subunit of this spike protein. And it has been shown experimentally that the mutation uh, renders a higher infectivity to, to the viruses. And Corberatil suggested that there have been multiple independent instances globally. So, and you can see that the D614Z here in this figure is the, the, 
the mutation in this position is taking over the isolates all over the world. So if you look into the latest isolates, you'll find that most of them have the D614GG mutations. So now the question comes like whether there are uh, any distinct populations in the different body sites. For example, if you take the samples from the nasopharyngeal cell, oropharyngeal saliva, and endotracheal spreads, and if you look at the longitude, if you do the uh, longitudinal studies, whether that viral, uh, if the viral genotype changes over time, or if there are any differences in the, uh, the viral genome you know, uh, circulating in the uh, different body sites. So still, it's an under assessment, but in general populations, this is quite consistent. There is no specific uh, evolution over time. For example, if you look, it's a bit blurred, sorry about that. So you can see that actually. So in the, this figure, you don't find any differences in the uh, viral genotype uh, mutations, any rel relation to the viral mutations of the viral genotype along uh, with the different body sites. So it means that they're quite consistent in different body parts of a person. And genome structure and patient outcome. So that's one of the things I was emphasized, we are emphasizing that the GSIAID, we are submitting the genomes. Uh, people all around the world are submitting the genomes to the GSID, but that GSID database is lacking the patient metadata. For example, so, uh, for example uh, some labs submitting 1,000 genomes, but they're providing only uh, metadata for the 20 to 30 uh, patients. So, so that's basically hindering the finding the specific viral mutations and the patient outcome, even though there are some uh, sporadic studies. This is a very small study that was done in Philadelphia. Uh, I should have acknowledged them. So, and uh, there is no obvious clustering or a specific polymorphism that is associated with the disease outcome. So that means that the patient with a hospitalized patient who died, there is no specific correlation if they isolate differ among these different groups. But it needs to be tested in a very wide range of population. Wow. So another important question comes uh, uh, because remdesivir is being used quite widely, and uh, one study shows that uh, the, rem the remdesivir binding site is the computational model shows that the remdesivir binding site is in the position 4937 to 4947, and there is no accumulation of mutations in these positions. So. It shows that the remdesivir uh, computational modeling shows that the remdesivir is still very effective drug it, because there is no mutation in the in the binding sites. So you never know. So how the uh, uh, how it evolves if you keep using the indiscriminate use of remdesivir might confer the resistant uh, resistant to this drug. Okay. So summary. Here you go. So all Bangladesh strains has a D614G mutations and uh, belong to the character cervical 8A2. I have not shown the data here. Uh, phylogenetic analysis shows that the three distinct clusters with nine subclusters. And uh, while the global mutation is 7.23, Bangladesh isolates has a very high rate of mutation, 12.6. And we have shown the, the latest isolates in also genome resistance studies. They're much bit, they're going a bit higher right now. So that means they're trying to adapt, adapt to the specific country and envi environment in the specific geographic locations. And obviously, so there is no relationship between the genome variants and the patient outcome or the disease outcome. And no obvious viral evolution longitudinally and especially within the infected people. But it's very difficult to say because the virus is just only for a short period of time within a patient. And no obvious evolution of remediable resistance have shown. So going forward, what do we need to do actually? We need to monitor the additional waves of infection in Bangladesh and possible function of new variants. As we shown that the, the virus is accumulating the new mutations. So the look in the functional genomics will look quite interesting to see. And that's very important for developing the potential target for intervention and vaccine. So yeah, with this, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Maksud, for such a wonderful presentation. And quite, uh, I'm pretty much sure our students are uh, they're learning a lot from all these findings. So, uh, um, 
please uh, to my students and uh, the audiences if you have any question this uh, ask your question in the chat so it can which will be answered addressed during the question session thank you so our next speaker um, So our next speaker is Dr. Mustafi Zurrahman. Uh, okay. So Dr. Mustafi Zurrahman is a senior scientist and head of virology laboratory, ICDDRB, and he is an adjunct faculty of our department, associate professor. So Mr. Rahman has completed his BS and MS in microbiology in, from the University of Dhaka. He did his PhD from Belgium, Leuven, Belgium, and postdoc from the University of Florida, USA. He has a broad background of infectious uh, background in infectious diseases for more than 15 years, with specific training and expertise in viral epidemiology, genetics, vaccine, and drug trials. Mr. Rahman and his lab colleagues have been comprehensively involved in government effort to COVID-19 pandemic responses. His team is supporting DG, uh, DGHS to establish new COVID-19 um, testing laboratories all over the country and strengthen the capacity of laboratory staff and by safety standards of the newly established laboratories. He's also a member and advisor of the GOB COVID-19 uh, emergency committees. On top of that, he's involved in several ongoing research studies on COVID-19, including vaccine and drug trials. So today, uh, Dr. Uh, Mustafa Zurahman is going to present on a topic titled COVID-19 vaccine, how close are we? So without making much delay, I would like to request Dr. Mustafi to continue with his speech. Over to you, Dr. Mustafi. Thank you, uh, Professor Naima, uh, for your kind words. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thanks for attending this session. Uh, as a last speaker, I'm going to talk about the end game of COVID-19 pandemic situation, that is vaccines. So let me share my slides. Uh, okay. Uh, the title is COVID-19 vaccine, how close are we? Uh, I have splitted my talk into uh, different uh, sections. First, I'll talk about the stages and strategies of vaccine development. And we'll see how fast these steps were followed by the COVID-19 vaccine development. And in the second part, I'll describe some promising vaccine candidates. Uh, let's start with vaccine development. You know that everybody is eagerly waiting for a vaccine. Uh, the issue of prospective COVID-19 vaccines appears to be a major concern all over the world. Numerous uh, co coronavirus vaccine development programs are currently being run at a first pace. But people are impatient, you know, for getting for vaccine right now. In the situation, some scientists have already started vaccinated themselves. And even sometimes they are vaccinated their friends and families with unproven version of vaccines by bypassing uh, the rigorous test and raising the fear of potential side effects. Uh, you can, <laughs> it is not there actually at this moment, but vaccine was offered via Facebook by North Coast Bio. They had some spike protein vaccine. Uh, they made it and two shots were given for uh, $400. But FDA has recently issued letters to these companies to stop these misdeeds. Uh, moving uh, forward to Russia, 
President Vladimir Putin said in early August that they were ready for use Sputnik vaccine outside of clinical trials. At the same time, a couple of Chinese vaccines have been given approval for emergency use without completing all required phases of clinical trial. But, you know, it is unacceptable and unsafe before you complete all different stages of vaccine trials. You may hear about the recent pause of Oxford vaccine trial. It was very uh, much promising vaccine. And last week, the phase three trial of this vaccine has been put on hold due to a suspected serious adverse reaction in a, patient, in a participant. Uh, this indicates uh, the importance of following guideline. Good news is that several drug companies agreed uh, that they would follow guidelines from agencies like the Food and Drug Administration and complete large clinical trials before any potential vaccine was released. So what is the guideline? First stage uh, is preclinical trial. You have to go through some research on the virus and vaccine strategies suitable for a robust immune response, which can protect us from the virus infection. In this stage, animal model can be used. A number of doses is also decided in this stage. And after that, you see that phase one, phase one trial uh, should be conducted. And phase one trial uh, is done with few healthy adult volunteers to observe the safety, adverse effect, and potential risk. Then, if you pass the phase one trial, you have to go to the phase two, targeting hundreds of volunteers to see the side effects and immunogenicity of the vaccine. And finally, you have to do the phase three trial, which includes thousands of people to see the effectiveness and immunogenicity. All results are then submitted to, uh, for approval. And after getting the license, you can use, the vaccine is ready to use uh, in, the, in, in the field, but you can do a phase four trial where safety monitoring and potential adverse effect are observed in real world situation. So why these guidelines should be followed? Because you want the best vaccine, right? So you have to careful about this uh, from the very beginning of vaccine development. You also may need to consider many challenges to find out a suitable vaccine such as uh, ensuring long-term protective antibody response and minimize the antibody dependent enhancement, which was observed with dengue vaccines, you know, and ensure immune responses in different age groups, uh, since vaccination may include much lower immune, uh, induce much lower immune responses in elderly as compared to younger population. So you have to care about all these issues. Then uh, choice of vaccine strategy is another important issue. And I have included here showing uh, different type of strategies like DNA and RNA vaccines, which have not been any, any vaccines like DNA and RNA have been uh, licensed yet, but it is very promising, uh, uh, much effective. And, and the, in the safety issue uh, is uh, very good because uh, there is no safety issue because you are using the DNA or RNA. <clears throat> Next is live attenuated vaccine. This is a uh, very old fashion, the live uh, vaccine, uh, live uh, and weakened uh, viruses are used for this. And, and the third one is inactivated vaccine. So inactivated vaccine is just, you have to kill the vaccine. So uh, there is a safety issue. If it is not killed very well, uh, it will be a big problem. Next one is subunit vaccine. So this vaccine uses a piece of a virus surface uh, to focus your immune uh, system on a uh, single target. And then finally, protein vaccines, uh, viral vector vaccines. So this viral vector vaccines uses a virus which is not actually replicating or replicating, but not uh, uh, doing any uh, bad in your uh, body. So these are the strategy and based on these strategies, uh, uh, you see the number of COVID vaccines have been, uh, uh, which have been developed. In the x-axis, you can see the numbers and y-axis, the different strategies. And using these strategies, at least 37 vaccines are now in clinical trial on human. Uh, 
24 of them is in phase one, 14 in phase two, nine in phase three, and three uh, is uh, uh, approved for uh, limited use. So let's start with Sinovac. Uh, I'm going to talk about some promising va candidate vaccine at this moment. So Sinovac is an inactivated vaccine manufactured by a Chinese company and phase one and two have been completed and no severe adverse effects were identified among the volunteers uh, participated in, the, in these trials. So the phase three trials uh, are ongoing in Brazil, Indonesia and Turkey. And you know that Bangladesh government uh, allowed uh, this phase three vaccine trial in Bangladesh. And ICDGRB will conduct this trial in seven Dhaka-based hospitals uh, uh, among 4,200 frontline health workers. Um, and most likely it will start at the end of this month. Oxford vaccine is uh, a most promising vaccine. You have heard uh, about Oxford vaccine. This vaccine is based on vector adenovirus. The spike protein of coronavirus is engineered into a known virulent uh, adenovirus so that coronavirus spike, spike protein uh, can uh, have the specific immune response. And uh, it is also in the phase three trial at this moment and the trials are ongoing in the United States, United Kingdom, Brazil, and South Africa. Next one is CanSino Bio. This is, uh, uh, has been licensed for limited use in China, uh, which is also used uh, adenovirus as a vector. And the phase three trial is ongoing in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. And this is Russian vaccine. The Gamalaya Research Institute in Russia launched a clinical trial in June and in August they gave approval this vaccine for limited use. The differences from other vector-based vaccines such as Oxford or CanSino Bio is that this Russian vaccine is based on two adenovirus vectors. Uh, the coronavirus spike protein is engineered in two adenovirus vectors which will be used in two different doses. So they hope that they will uh, provoke more immune response uh, in the second dose. Next one is Moderna. You have heard about Moderna. This is very promising RNA-based uh, vaccine. It's a collaboration with NIH. Uh, the phase three trial is ongoing and they are going to include 30,000 healthy people at around uh, 89 sites in, in the United States. States. Uh, the last one that I am presenting here is uh, also a RNA based vaccine, which has been developed in collaboration with German company BioNTech, Pfizer, and also uh, a Chinese company Fosun Pharma. They also started the phase three trial in the United States, Argentina, and Brazil. As I mentioned, uh, there are at least 12 vaccines are in uh, phase three. It is expected that a suitable vaccine could be available at the end of 2020 or beginning of 2021. But until the day that the first vaccine arrives, what we'll do? We need a plan B for our protection, right? So in this regard, if face mask can protect you, researchers have proposed the new theory that mask might offer a good form of immunization. How? by allowing few viruses through these masks. Uh, so the quantity of viruses you are getting by wearing this mask is so low that it will not make you sick, but potentially provoking an immune response to fight the pathogens. So this is an alternative vaccine maybe, uh, but there are debates about this and you should prove before you claim this type of uh, statement. So you know that most of the offices and business centers in Bangladesh are open now to maintain the guideline of social distancing considering the socioeconomic condition of Bangladesh. So let's hope we will not observe any spike in coming days by constantly using this very important face mark until we get a good vaccine. So I will stop here. Thank you very much everybody for your patience.
stay safe. Uh, over to uh, Professor Naima. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mustafi, for such a wonderful presentation and insightful information. So surely our students will be benefited with all this uh, presentation today. So I can see there are several questions from our students. So uh, I would like to take help of uh, Fahmida and Mezabin for this uh, part. So Fahmida already have posted several questions. So the first question is to uh, Dr. Uh, Kajinadi. Hassan. Uh, Nadim, yes. sir, there is a question about um, how much credible is CRISPR based uh, Sherlock or detective techniques for SARS CoV 2 detection? Yamin Hamid, our student. Yes, but I think that is the computational techniques, in silico techniques. If, 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 if uh, you want to make it credible, you have to validate it by comparing with the large studies, by doing weight labs, molecular biology detection method, as well as it should be correlated with clinical findings to determine the sensitivity specificity of that test. Then it will be credible, I think. Okay? I hope, Yamin, you got your answer. The next question is to, uh, to Dr. Maksud Hussain. Uh, does the variation in the sequence indicate the virus is any way less harmful compared to other? Well, that's a very difficult question. That's a billion dollar question, yeah? So, <laughs> and, uh, so you can't say anything about the sequence. So you need to combine lots of clinical data, the environmental data, and, uh, and also the ex you need the experimental validations. So the way the mutations are accumulating, it's very difficult to experiment all of them in the lab. So as I said, the only sequencing doesn't give you the answer to the degree of infectivity of your viruses. But looking into the current uh, genome structure, we have seen that we found that the mutations are more related to the geographic locations rather than the disease outcome. So, and also depends on the host genetics and as well as the comorbidity. So to find any correlation, we need large clinical data and experimental evidences uh, to find out the correlation between the mutations and disease outcome. And Locations of mutations are also very important, and you also need to know that whether the mutations are conferring any changes in the amino acids or not. So very important things. So it's not a like single yes or no answer. So as I said, it's a very complex, complex uh, method. So that does no. So you can't say anything from only the sequence variations. Okay, so. I think uh, there is another question to Dr. Maksud. Dr. Naima, uh, can I supplement to Dr. Maksud's? Yeah, sure. And answers? Sure. For, because of the variation, the viral function may be lost or may be increased. Both can occur, okay? But whether it has occurred increasing or decreasing activity, it has you have to establish this fact by doing a large studies and you have to correlate with the large metadata. Otherwise, you, can you cannot establish this fact, whether it has function, function increased or infectivity increase or decrease, but both can occur. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um Okay, there is another question for Dr. Matsud again. So this is from our uh, colleague, um, Abhinandan. So what could potentially explain the higher global mutation event in Bangladesh compared to the rest of the world? Well, I think we have shown, yeah, so we have shown, a, so we have shown, uh, have you seen the next strength epidemiological uh, phylogenetics? So it's quite interesting that like, I think wherever it's going, it accumulates in the geographic specific mutations. So, so that means that it's not, for example, uh, when it came to Bangladesh, it has a certain number of uh, mutations and, it, and the, it looks like from the data that it's because of the environmental factors. So that's causing the mutations of this, uh, of this uh, higher, higher mutations to these isolates.
I think uh, Abhinandan, you got your answer. So, Kaji uh, Fahmida Rahman, I think you can ask your question by yourself to Dr. Maksud Hussain and Dr. Mustafizur Rahman. You're there, right? Fahmida, please. Over to you. Means that wasn't from me, and uh, basically yeah. it's from a student, but okay. he or she didn't him. get any. Okay. okay, okay, you can ask on behalf of her or him. So, all right, yeah. So, the question for Dr. Mustafizur that is, could the higher mutation in Bangladeshi COVID 19 strains play any significant role in its disease causing ability? Um, I think this is more related to uh, Maksud, uh, but uh, there is no evidence at this moment. And Maksud already showed that disease severity was not related to the changes, right? Yes, I can, I can supplement Dr. Yeah. Mustafa. So, yes. uh, right. so to plan, there is no evidence right now. This is causing an effect will be evidenced if it is mutation, but so far, so far, I have seen no mutation was found. All are variations. Am I clear? So, yeah. So the question you was, that mutation, was you cannot say mutation unless until you evidence a protein function is disrupted. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, you have got my answer. The, the cut anyway. It's from a student who has. Mentioned okay. uh, his or her name. Okay. So it looks like we have answered all the questions so far asked in our chat box. So, is there anything else that uh, you would like to mention, uh, speakers? I had another question, I think, uh, to yes. uh, Mustafa Okay. Yes. Uh, this is Tell again from our student. This yeah. is again from our student. The question is uh, to Dr. Mustafa Rahman. And the question is, is there any difference between DNA vaccine in Inovio and RNA vaccine Moderna in terms of safety and efficacy? Uh, we have to wait uh, when the phase three uh, trials are completed. These are not completed. So efficacy is, you know, uh, we can uh, be sure about the efficacy after the completion of phase three. Uh, but uh, efficacy and safety. Safety is, uh, I, I mentioned that these DNA and RNA vaccines are safe because you are not going to uh, inoculate any type of virus, part virus there. So uh, for DNA, for example, you have to put it in the plasmid and plasmid will go inside your body and this will, uh, plasmid encoded antigens are produced and uh, as for RNA vaccine, you have to just include the mRNA and you know that mRNA for specific, for example, spike protein, this protein, the antigens will be produced. No other mechanisms of the virus are included in DNA and RNA vaccine. So th this is absolutely safe. But efficacy, uh, we have to wait. But in phase one and phase two trials, the efficacy was quite good. Uh, and, and because those efficacy or effectiveness was good, it, it passed the phase one and phase two, and then it, it entered into the phase three. So we have to wait to see the results from phase three. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mustafizur Rahman. Um, well, uh, Dr. Okay. Naima. Uh, yes, this is sir. Uh, this is Rakhori Sharkar. Uh, yeah, I have a general, uh, you know, uh, question to the panel. Uh, we have seen the lot of, uh, you know, variation or mutation in in our uh, strains here in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm I'm not a you know virologist or any background, but I, I want to know what what is actually maybe the reason behind this kind of variation in Bangladesh. Because particularly if you see the compared to the other countries we have a lot of variation or, or whatever the mutation is. So can the panel can say anything regarding this, uh, you know, variation in, in Bangladesh? Yeah. So, so sir, uh, 
we have uh, uh, actually there are 300 more than 300 sequences are available uh, from, from Bangladesh. Uh, so the variations that we have found, uh, I have the question uh, to uh, Maksud, uh, yeah. uh, the 12.6% versus 7 point something in the global uh, mutation rate. How did you calculate these? And 12.6% per year uh, part substitution or uh, uh, just I was confused about this percentage. Can you just explain? And oh, oh. Uh, for sure that I, I think that uh, if you go, because I have already uh, analyzed some of those uh, uh, sequences from India, like Delhi, uh, Kolkata, Gujarat, and found that uh, Bangladeshi strains are not, uh, the mutation rate is not so high compared to those areas. So can you explain, please? Thank you. Yeah. Definitely, sir. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that I'm not saying that that's a, that's a sub. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we, we can yeah. hear you. Please oh, carry okay. on. Okay. Yeah. So so most of his body. The thing is, what what we're saying that the, that's the substitution rate. So substitution rate is three point five to ten to the power minus four in Bangladesh isolates compared to the Wuhan virus. And the mutation rate all over the world, you know, I think that's six times uh, 10 to the power minus four. So the mutation rate uh, compared to the Wuhan is, the rate is very low in case of Bangladesh isolates, but 12.6 mutations even per sample, it's just a per, per sample, we got the, for example, like the, in NSU isolates, we found the 16 mutations. Yeah, 16 mutations. So. If you look into the, did you have a look at the, the next uh, video? Let so this, this is par isolate, right? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Isolate. So, so it, it was yeah. so high, that's, that's why. The par isolate yeah. is, uh, is among 30,000. Mm. Okay, so this is, yeah, I understand. So, yeah. And if you look, and there is another question asked by the Rakhori sir. So what's the reason? Yeah, so can you see the video, sir? Yeah, we can see the video. Yeah, can you see the animation? See the this is quite interesting. Yeah. yeah, so if you look into this one, I'll just stop here. So you see the accumulation of mutations here. You can see the green uh, circles here. Mm -hmm. And that indicates the form where these isolates are coming to Bangladesh. Yeah. But after this until the April, so if you go be after the April, there's still this isolates are coming to Bangladesh and meet a, uh, okay. So now if you come up to the July, actually, if you see the isolates, they are not coming from any other countries. They're, the mutations are starting uh, accumulating from, uh, it's, it's a like geograph like country specific mutations. Mm -hmm. So isolates that entered in by the April or May so they started the accumulating mutations that are country specific. That means this is related to the environmental factors. So that's how we're getting the high number of mutations after a certain period of time. So that's just an assumption. So because I don't, we don't have the clinical data, yeah. Yes. Sir. Uh, uh, can I can I supplement this for Maksud? Yeah. So I have yeah. gone through one one fifty one data from Bangladesh. So yeah. there it has. Only seven types of variations are found, mostly among those seven types. Variations, the predominant variations I observed, which is predominant globally, the type 87, which is, you know, that uh, goes for GR clade. Okay, that's the mm -hmm. predominant strain. Uh, the sound in globally as well as in Bangladesh. In addition to that, five other or six other types of variants yes, we have found, sir. Rakhuri, sir. So then no, no, those variations, other than predominant variation, those variations, why those are evolving in Bangladesh? To establish that fact, you need metadata, sir. Whether it is from different locations within the Bangladesh, 
to establish if you have the data or if you have clinical data you could say that all are same all are same but whether uh, virus becomes variant due to time evolution yeah. this conclusion uh, can could be done after that study sir okay sir okay thank you very much uh, nadim thank you <laughs> thank you nadim so thank you sir yeah. Uh, for yes. the question, I'm afraid that we are running out. We are already we have exceeded the time, and uh, there is one last question that probably I will be able to ask. So, and that is to uh, generally, uh, it's from uh, Nausha Hussain, who wants to know about uh, what would be uh, would uh, would it be possible uh, for speakers to comment on where they believe our country is headed with COVID-19 crisis right now in general. I think most of is very... Can I? Yeah. Yeah, please. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we are actually involved in the uh, laboratory network of the government from the very beginning. And uh, you know that uh, every day we have uh, the uh, figures of COVID positive cases. Uh, the death cases are stable, 30, 40 like this, but the, the rates is going down in last two and three weeks. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in, I think, July, August, uh, you can see that the rate was 20 to 25 percent. And now, now, in last two weeks, this is 12 percent. So uh, this is the average from all over the country. Maybe some of these places it is high, maybe 25%, 30%, and some places it is only 10% or 5%. So this is the average of all over the country that the data is coming. So it is going down, and I hope in next two weeks it will go down to 10%. This is my assumption because uh, we have shown, we, we, we just did a community-based surveillance and we have shown that 9% of Dhaka city inhabitants, they were infected by uh, COVID-19, uh, COVID they were positive. And 80% of them were asymptomatic. And uh, so I, I expect that many of us have been already infected so you know that hard immunity, we, we say, this is a very popular word, hard immunity, popular uh, uh, issue. So more than 50 to 60% of Dhaka city inhabitants, they have been already uh, uh, infected, asymptomatic or symptomatic. This is my opinion. This is not proved actually. Uh, so if you have 50 to 60%, the transmission rate will be lower, transmission rate will be reduced. So I, I hope we are just uh, observing this, this trend, the curving, uh, the, the, the bending the curve. We are uh, at, the, at the other end of the hill of the curve. So it was also shown, uh, seen in, in New York City uh, that uh, this is going down and down and now you know that in New York this is uh, about to decline. So I hope uh, within next month, we can go for work, everybody, and our university will open uh, in not October, but maybe I'm sure November. This is my, my wish, and, and I hope. The data also tells, uh, tell us like that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mustafi, something? sir. Yeah. Can I add something to Dr. Mustafi? <laughs> yes, please. Health? According to the public health specialist in Bangladesh or everywhere, so for any pandemic situation, if the prevalence of identification is recognized 5%, less than 5%, and within the 5% for three weeks continuous, then it can be said that it is properly controlled, prevented, efficiently. That's my, I, I learned from a talk show. That's why. Okay. Yeah, you that, are absolutely right. <laughs> you are absolutely right. We hope okay. for the best. Okay. Uh, I, the, there is another question. I'm sorry, but uh, probably uh, it is to most of his, uh, hi, most of his sir. So uh, in this pandemic situation, people in urban slums, particularly in Dhaka, are less affected. Is this due to less data or uh, their higher immunity? 
<laughs> this is interesting, very interesting that you cannot see so many cases from SLAM. Yeah. Uh, my hypothesis is that they were already infected in February and March or in January, okay? In the beginning, beginning of our introduction of COVID-19 in Bangladesh. Okay. Uh, there are some evidence that we have found a lot of uh, slum people uh, have antibodies. This has not, not been published yet, but uh, we have already, uh, this data shows that they have already infected. So why they were not so sick or, or the disease was, was severe, the hypothesis is that they are uh, living in such a condition that they, they, they are already infected by previously before COVID by other coronavirus, the cousins of this coronavirus. You know that four different coronaviruses are circulating all over the year and they have protected them, I think. Not I think, but some paper published that uh, they investigated the pre-COVID sera and tried to neutralize with the COVID-19 antigen and they neutralized. And since they had this type of coronavirus like or the cousins antibodies, they were neutralizing the COVID-19 also. So uh, in the slum population, there are, uh, you know, the density is very high, very high dense uh, people are living there. And uh, when they were infected, everybody were infected uh, in, in a very short time and they got the antibodies against COVID-19. This is the second hypothesis. So uh, overall, they were protected. And at that moment, we have a project uh, funded by Gates Foundation. We are looking at the slums and we are getting very few people uh, COVID-19 positive. Thank you. Thank you, Can sir. I Thank add Dr. Mustafa's third hypothesis? <laughs> yes, <laughs> please, because please. The slum area peoples, most of the time they spend their time in open area. True or false? Open area. So they are exposed to low viral load, as you said. So if they're exposed to low viral load, so that will make them exposure, but not symptoms appears, they become zero. That's, that's the point you can think about. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm afraid that we are running out of time. Yes, Actually, yes. We, are, we have exceeded uh, quite long. So thank you all uh, for your question. There are many unanswered questions as well. So uh, I would like to, uh, uh, since all three speakers are our very own faculty members, so I think students, who, those who have many queries, you can right away come, uh, or you can contact with your faculties through email and you can get your answers if with uh, any queries you have. I'm pretty much sure our uh, wonderful faculties are going to help you uh, with, uh, or we're going to answer your question. We, I mean, they'd love to uh, do so. Right, sir? Okay. So I think, so it, it, you're always, always welcome to our department and I know that our colleagues are very cordial, they cordially deal our students. So thank you all. Um, I'd like to call up on now our uh, uh, our session chair today's session chair uh, our uh, acting dean professor uh, dr hassan mahmud reza uh, acting dean of school of health and life sciences so we all know that reza sir as our a uh, dynamic leader who is leading the school right now. He is a prominent researcher of the North South University and Reza sir has led the Department of Pharmacy as the chair for a quite long time and also as the uh, dean of our school and several, uh, several times before he was assigned now. And today we are honored to have such a talented dynamic academician who has taught uh, and did research home and abroad and has, has been teaching NSU for a very quite long time. So we are delighted to have uh, Reza Sir amongst us and, to, uh, and he, he, uh, I would like to request Sir to say a few words about this today's webinar. Sir, over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Neymar, for your nice words. Actually, although I don't deserve all these good words, 
But anyway, thank you for your generosity. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, I could manage time to attend this webinar. And uh, I really was enjoying the whole session. I heard and I was hearing very attentively the very insightful talks by three experts, Professor Nadim, Dr. Maksud, and Dr. Mustafiz. And all these three speakers, they have pointed out three different things and that are directly related to this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Professor Nadim basically talked about the, the necessity of uh, testing and uh, once we are going to have proper testing, then we need to trace, contact trace, and we can go further for testing and finding out the patients who are actually infected by this uh, SARS-CoV-2. And also he has mentioned that uh, we need to develop the treatment facilities as well. And he has uh, given very nice uh, uh, information regarding some problems that uh, were encountered during testing in different parts of the country. We found that uh, in a very short period of time, a very good number or a large number of centers are developed for testing using RT-PCR. And we all know that RT-PCR is a very, very sophisticated technique. It is not only a testing, but it requires huge uh, arrangement so that the test result can be the actual one. It, it should not be a fake one. But without arranging all those things, we just increase our uh, testing laboratories. And we later found that so many fake results and um, things happened that were uh, actually unwanted to all of us. Then uh, Dr. Maksud actually showed uh, some relevance of genome sequencing. And that is basically very, very important uh, in case of developing vaccines. And followed uh, by Maksud, uh, Dr. Mustafiz, he has nicely shown the developmental stages of vaccines and um, also, he has given some current scenario of vaccine development worldwide. Uh, uh, two things actually uh, I, I picked up. Uh, one thing we are talking, our one speaker was talking about the heart immunity. And the other one is, is uh, uh, Professor Akhari actually made a very nice question, why the high rate of mutation uh, we are finding in Bangladesh? Actually, these two questions, uh, if we can find out the real answers, then it could be easier for us to contain the uh, transmission as well as uh, we can reduce the transmission rate uh, by adopting the right uh, uh, measure. It's really very difficult to say at this moment, what are those reasons? And we are all trying to find out those reasons. Heart immunity, actually, uh, I'm a bit confused as because uh, some studies uh, are telling that the heat of this antibody in the body is uh, not for a long time. So if it is a very short-lived antibody, then even uh, this hard immunity is not going to work for us. The other point is, uh, uh, that was also very interesting and uh, Dr. Mustafi is actually uh, answered very well. Uh, I, I must say uh, that is the uh, good answer. Uh, why this lump? Slum people are not well, uh, very uh, affected or infected. Even uh, we, if we consider that they are not, or they were not infected earlier by this SARS-CoV-2, but it is not unlikely that they had some infection in some time in their life by one of the variants of coronavirus. So there might be some cross reactivity. And now several studies are also trying to point out this cross reactivity uh, that might uh, help um, how the people are being saved uh, from this uh, coronavirus uh, infection. So these are very uh, nice topics and nice things. I love to hear always the scientific uh, explanations and uh, all these talks are very interesting and uh, all are very informative. And uh, I'm sure that uh, today or tomorrow, some vaccines will come. Recently, we have heard that uh, uh, two patients showed some adverse uh, reactions or effects, and because of that, the trial is uh, now on hold. But this is a very common thing, and we should not be panicked, or we cannot say that that vaccine is going to be thrown away. Rather, 
it is the time to understand why that happened. Actually, it is because of the vaccine or it is because of some other things. Once we get the uh, answers to those questions, then again, I believe the trial will go on. At the same time, uh, although uh, we are trying, we know that uh, more than 10 vaccines actually uh, are coming up with some promising results. And uh, we would like to believe that really these vaccines will work for us. And once we have these uh, vaccines available, then uh, we'll, we'll be happy and we can protect ourselves and we can resume the regular activities. That is our hope. And with this hope, we need to go forward. But nevertheless, the plan B that has been mentioned by Dr. Mustafiz, I would like to emphasize that we need to follow the health rules. We need to use the masks. We need to maintain the social distancing and following all those things, uh, we can uh, hope for a healthy, uh, better life. And uh, I think uh, as a session chair, I don't have any particular topic. I, it was my duty to summarize some of the things that uh, were interesting to me. I tried to say some words and thank you very much for attending uh, this uh, webinar. I would like to thank especially Dr. Mustafiz, who is a renowned scientist at ICDDRB. And it is also our great pleasure that he is a part of North South University. And uh, Dr. Professor Mustafiz is a senior professor. And uh, I have seen Dr. Mustafiz a very, very dedicated researcher and uh, he's uh, almost uh, spending the whole day for different type of research. And uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, he has been playing a very significant role uh, by giving a lot of uh, uh, lecture sessions uh, to the people where it is appropriate. And uh, all the uh, audience who actually listened, I must thank them. This kind of session is uh, for the audience. If this thing actually provides any any good information for the audience, then the audience will be benefited. And ultimately, the purpose of organizing this kind of webinar will be successful. I must thank Dr. Naima. Uh, she is a very young, dynamic, new chair, uh, taking the uh, taking a lot of new initiatives. And also, this today's webinar is also a new initiative taken by her. I must thank Naima for arranging this uh, webinar. And uh, finally, I would like to say that everyone will stay fine and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your valuable speech and insightful comments. Uh, we are really honored that you, you could manage your time out of your busy schedule today for us. I'm sure that our current and prospective students and the participating audience have enjoyed today's session. Uh, because of time limitation, uh, we couldn't uh, address all your questions, but our, uh, uh, you can, you're always welcome to communicate with our speakers. I think uh, uh, you will get your answer with uh, personal communication as well. So I'd like to thank Maza bin Hussain, Kaji Fahmida Rahman, and Ahmed Ishtiak, uh, lecturer of our Department of Biochemistry Microbiology, who helped, us, uh, helped me in arranging and coordinating the program. I also would like to thank all the members of the executive body of our very own Life Science uh, uh, Bio Bioscience Club, as well as the, all the other members who have uh, participated and uh, played role cordially. And for your enthusiasm. And last but not the least, uh, the North South University IT department, especially Mr. Mahbubul Haq Sharkar and his team, and NSU Public Relations Department, especially Mr. Yasri, for hosting the for hosting and live streaming of this webinar. Uh, I need to make an important announcement. That is, uh, the deadline for MS in biotech admission is in September 15. So those who are planning to apply uh, to join our program, please apply at your earliest convenience. The deadline is 15th of September of this month. Uh, so today's webinar will be available uh, after the live session is, uh, uh, after this live session, it will be accessible through the same link you have, you're using right now. Thank you all for your cordial participation in today's webinar. We hope to see you next time. So good night. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, everybody for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, Fist. Mm.